Now, thank God for each of you that are here. And this is a word from Paul that is telling us to separate and consecrate. That's right. Separate and consecrate. Separate yourselves uh -huh. and consecrate yourselves. Amen. It is a word that is telling us to get away from certain things Amen. and then get close to God. Yes. Amen. Are you with me? Yes. Now, when you talk about separation and consecration, you're talking about something that means a lot. Yes, sir. But the subject of separation is a subject that people don't like. A lot of people misunderstand what separation really means. Most people, they think that spiritual separation means that they have to give up this and quit going there and stop doing that. And they feel that you can't enjoy the pleasures of the world. And this is what most people believe in. And they believe that spiritual separation consists of this. Not going here, not being involved in that, stop doing this and that. Which it does has a part in it to play. But the greatest call in the world by God is to be called to separation. It is a call to separation and a call to consecration. Yes, sir. Amen. Now, this is dealing with the believer and the unbeliever. We must realize that even though we have two people in the world, two kinds of people, the believer and the unbeliever, both share the world together. The believer... He has his issues. He is not without flaws. He is working on himself. But the deal is, he is doing all he can to please God. Amen. I'm glad I'm a believer. Amen. I didn't say I was perfect. I said I'm glad I'm a believer. Amen. Now, the first call is for an open heart. And an open heart is very important for separation and consecration. Amen. And no one is going to separate himself from the world and consecrate his life to God unless he has an open heart and an open mind. Now, when you look at Paul in the text, Paul's heart is open and full of affection for the Corinthian church. Yes, sir. And so he speaks to them directly and he says, oh, ye Corinthians. He speaks to them as though he was face to face talking with them. And then he says, open, or he says, our mouth is open to you. Uh -huh. He has spoken openly and honestly without hesitation. Right. And then he says, our heart is enlarged. His heart is open to them and his affection has grown as he has been sharing with them. And then he says, you are not straightened in us. Now the word straightened means to be restricted. It means to lack room. Uh -huh. And Paul says that there was no lack of room in his heart for the church. There is no restriction against them. I hope you're listening to me. He held nothing against them, and his heart was wide open to receive them. But the church was closed to Paul. Their hearts were straightened and restricted, and they had very little room, if any, for Paul. The Apostle Paul, he begins to appeal to them and ask them to return the same heart that he had shown unto them. Now, Paul calls them his children, just as children open their hearts and receive their parents with affection. He begs them to receive him and receive his instructions with affection. Right. 
Now, there are two things that are necessary if the church is ever going to hear the call of God. The church must have a minister with an open heart and a loving heart toward God and his people. And secondly, the church must have an open heart and a loving heart toward God and the minister that has been chosen to feed the flock. Now the Bible teaches us in John 13 and 35, by this shall men know that you are my disciples if you have love one toward another. Look at somebody and tell them I love you and there ain't a thing you can do about it. The second call is for believers not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now we have the unbeliever and we have the believer. And the reason why is because believers are different from unbelievers. Now it refers back in the book of Leviticus chapter 22 when in the Old Testament when God gave a command and God forbade the plowing of an ox with a donkey. Mm -hmm. He said, do not yoke these two together. Right. Even though the donkey can be used to plow it mm -hmm. and an ox can be used to pull. But God is saying, don't put these two together. Right. You can put two ox or you can put two donkeys, mm -hmm. but you cannot put the donkey and the mule together right. and plow the field. No. And he is telling us that we cannot Put these in a union. Now the union of a genuine believer. I'm not talking about a half stepper. A genuine believer with an unbeliever would be as different as the union between two kinds of animals. The plowing through life of a believer with an unbeliever would be as difficult as the plowing of a field with an ox and a donkey yoked together. Amen. When you hook yourself up with an unbeliever and you are a genuine believer, you don't have the same mindset. Right. Genuine believers are very different from the unbeliever. Amen. And there are five reasons that reveal the fact that they are different. Believers differ from unbelievers in fellowship. Amen. So what fellowship in the text does righteousness have with unrighteousness? Mm -hmm. The word unrighteousness means lawlessness. Amen. Unbelievers have not obeyed God Amen. and they don't obey God. Amen. They live and do as they wish and not as God says. Mm -hmm. They reject God and what God says and they go on about doing their own thing. They rebel against God and they rebel against his commandments, living lawless and unrighteous lives. They have not believed in the name of the Lord Christ, Jesus Christ, in order for them to be saved. They don't seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. They're not thinking about being filled with the Holy Ghost. They're not trying to get close to God. I'm talking about the unbeliever. And another thing that they don't do, they don't hunger and thirst after righteousness. But notice the word fellowship in the text. The word fellowship means sharing and participation. So how can a believer who focuses his life upon the righteousness of Jesus Christ Share and participate with unbelievers who care little, if anything, about Jesus Christ and his call to righteousness. Believers differ from unbelievers even when it comes to communion. Amen. So the question is, what communion does light have with darkness? The word communion means to be in union. It means to be in partnership. Yeah. It means to be bound in fellowship. Yes. It means to be closely bound together. Yeah. Amen. It means to be so closely bound together that there 
is an open and a mutual sharing. And what, what one has, it belongs to the other. So the point is clear. Think about it now. The point is clear. There is no such communion. There is no union with light and darkness. Am I making it plain? On the contrary, light and darkness are of different natures entirely. Okay. Darkness don't run anything out. That's right. Darkness covers up That's right. where you can't see. Yeah. But light runs darkness out the way. Right. Light shines on everything. Right. And Jesus said, I am the light yeah. of the world. Yeah. Am I right about it? Yeah. And so... When Jesus, when God spoke in the beginning where there was darkness upon the face of the deep, thank God he said, let there be light. Yes, we got to have some light. Yes, we can't have darkness. No. We need the light. Yes, now, do not run away from the light. I don't care what you have done. I don't care what you are guilty of. I want you to know all of us are guilty of something. Every one of us got a past Every one of us have to say, Lord, forgive me for some reason or another. And I'm not saying you are living in sin, but never run away from the light. Because the light is going to shine upon you and it's going to cause you to improve your living. Let's say, help me, Lord. Thank God for the light. Because the light is a symbol for the believer. Believers are to become children of light because they believe in the light, which is Jesus Christ. Believers have been transferred from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of Christ, which is the inheritance of light. And before the believer came to Jesus, the believer had darkness on the inside. But when the believer came to Christ, they were placed in the light, capital L-I-G-H-T, placed in Jesus. And now the light, which is Jesus, the light of the world dwells in that person. And now since the light is in the believer, believers are the light of the world. Believers are to set their light on a candlestick. So their light can be easily seen. And the creation of light is a picture of removal of spiritual darkness. Now darkness is the symbol or a picture of unbelievers. And this is a powerful point because just as light and darkness is different, the nature of the believer and the unbeliever is very different. As children of light, believers know the light of God. Yes. They live by the light of God. Mm -hmm. And they are blessed by the light of God. Yes. As children of darkness, unbelievers know the darkness of this world. And they live by the darkness of the world. And they receive only the blessings of the world's darkness because they love darkness rather than light. Amen. And the only thing that darkness can give you is temporary pleasure and possessions, but it's temporary. And then finally, you have to experience the hopelessness of death and then the judgment. Thank God for Moses because Moses made a statement and he said, I'd rather suffer the afflictions of the righteous than to enjoy the pleasures of the world for a season. Yeah. 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 Help me say it's only for a season. Oh, Believers differ in attachment and they differ in covenant. Right. So the question is asked in the text of he, uh, Corinthians 6, what concord does Christ have with Belial? Oh, Belial refers to Satan. That's right. And the name Belial refers to the worthlessness the wickedness and the impurity of Satan's character. Amen. He is pictured as the head or leader 
of the unbeliever. Amen. Now I want you to know it's easy to say he's the head of my life. Yeah. It's easy to say that. But there's a scripture in the Bible that teaches us these folk honor the Lord with their mouths, but their hearts are far from him. That's right. So it's easy to talk. But is he the head? The believer has a head that's different from the unbeliever's head. Amen. Satan is the leader of the unbeliever. Amen. And what the believer goes by is the word of God. Amen. And the word of God, if it steps on his toes, he just say amen. amen. If it hits him, if it cuts him, he say amen. amen. If, it's, if it works on him, if it chastises him, if it spanks him, if it corrects him, he just humbled himself and said the word of God is right by itself. Amen. Lift your hand and say the word of God Amen. is right by itself. Amen. Let's say praise the Lord. And so the leader, that's the question. Because Christ is pictured. He's, he's pictured as the head or leader of the unbelievers. So the forces of good and evil stand opposed to each other. Christ and Satan don't sit in on the same seat. That's right. They don't come together. That's right. Christ stands opposed to Belial. Yes, the righteous one stands opposed to the wicked one. Yes. The worthy one stands opposed to the worthless one. Yes. The righteous and purity of Christ stand opposed to the wickedness and the impurity of the liar. Amen. Now, if a person does not follow Christ, then he is a follower of Satan who is Belial. Amen. And therefore, it is impossible for a genuine believer to live in harmony with those who follow the lead of Belial instead of following the leadership of Jesus Christ. Amen. Believers cannot be attached to those who live wicked and impure lives. Amen. Believers cannot be attached to people who follow the devil because you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Amen. You cannot drink and be a partaker of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Amen. See, they don't share the same room. No, they, don't. they don't have no fellowship. And believers, I'm talking about the believer and the unbeliever. Yeah. Believers are different in their belief. Yeah. So what part, what part does the believer have with the infidel? The infidel is a person who has chosen to be a disbelieve, he has chosen to disbelieve in Christ and has deliberately rejected him. Amen. The believer's faith has changed his whole life. Yeah. Because he believes, he's moving in another direction. Yeah. Are you listening to me? Say, help me, Lord. Yeah. Say, help me, Lord. Yeah. The believer, his belief has caused him to move into a whole new realm of life. He may live among unbelievers. The believer may be living and working next to the unbeliever. Amen. But he moves in a different realm. His purpose and behavior is very different. Amen. The believer believes that Christ is the Son of God. He believes that Christ is the Savior of the world and the infidel doesn't believe it the believer lives by the word of Christ and the infidel lives like he want to live the believer desires to honor Christ by putting Christ first and serving him but the infidel lives for self and he lives for the world I wonder how many believers do I have in the house the very meaning and purpose of life is different between the believer and the infidel. Amen. The believer seeks Christ and the things of Christ. And the infidel focuses his life primarily upon this world and he focuses his life mainly on pleasing himself. Right. The believer differs. He, he differs in worship. 
So what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? The word agreement means a close understanding. It means a close union. It means a close uh, bond of mind and spirit. So there can be no agreement, no union. There can be no bond whatsoever between the temple of God and idols. Right. Idolatry is despised by God because an idol is the substitute God for man. God does not love to see his people in idolatry because God is first and he'll never be second. An idol replaces God and it replaces God in his life. A man's idol may range from personal ideas all the way to graven images or possessions. I hope you're listening to me because this is going to help somebody. A man may worship and make an idol out of anything. And this is one of the most important differences between the behavior of the believer and the behavior of the unbeliever. Yes, the believer is not an idolater. The believer is the temple of God. And his body is the place where the Lord God dwells. God exists in three individuals. He exists as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And when you have God the Holy Ghost in you, God lives in you. Are y'all listening to me? Come on and shout, I got God living in me. The believer is able to know and feel the power of God in him because God said, I will dwell in them and I will walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So the point is clear. The believer worships the true and living God and he does not worship idols. He cannot agree with the worship of unbelievers. He cannot live and walk with unbelievers in worship. Because his worship is different from the worship of the unbeliever. And somebody wrote a song and said, my worship is for real. The third call for the, unbel for the believer is to come out. Yes. from unbelievers yes. you got to get away yes. you got to come out and separate yourself yes. now this refers back to Isaiah 52 and 11 and 12 when God led Israel out of the Babylonian captivity he told them to leave everything behind and they couldn't take anything out of the defiled land because they were to begin a new life under God's leadership. First of all, believers ought to come out from among unbelievers and be separate. Now, what does that mean? It does not mean that believers have to leave the cities. It doesn't mean that they have to leave the communities. It does not mean that they have to leave their workplaces or the world. Believers are not to isolate themselves from the unbeliever. It does not mean that the believer has nothing to do with the unbeliever because sometimes the unbeliever will help you before some of the believers will. Am I right about it? I will praise his name. It means sometimes that the unbeliever will come and rescue you and do some kind things so you don't know who you're going to need up the road. It does not mean that you get yourself away from the unbelievers because believers and unbelievers are in the world and they have to share the world together. But what God is saying is that believers and unbelievers are very different. Therefore, believers are not to be unequally yoked with the unbeliever. And they are not to be intimately involved in a relationship with the unbeliever. Your, your spouse and the one that you hooked up with, they need to be just like you. They need to fit in the category of 
that you're in. If you are a believer, you need to have a believer. And now, believer, if you go over to God, go and get you uh, a person. And that person that you get is an unbeliever. And you say, well, ain't no men in the church. you going to catch the devil with that unbeliever. Because he don't believe like you. And you'll have peace of mind. Are you listening to me? You ought to have some standards that you will not bow down to. So believers are not to be involved in a relationship with the unbeliever. And too many of our, our daughters, glory to God, uh, sometimes the daughters are, uh, are being sucked in because they're vulnerable. Yeah. And here come Slick Willie or here come uh, Tyrone coming in with his own goal uh, and get in the church with his focus to get one of the believers uh, because he knows that that sister out there in the world won't do him like the believer. Are y'all listening to me? So you got to watch what you deal with. Believers are not to be in fellowship with unbelievers. They are not to participate in worldly events. They are not to participate in ungodly events. In other words, where the unbeliever, what he enjoys, then we shouldn't be enjoying it if God has forbidden us because he has told us to come out from among them and separate ourselves. Believers are not to be in communion with unbelievers. They are not to be closely bound in partnership with unbelievers. They are not to be so united with unbelievers that there is an expectation and a need to be part of ungodly activities and behavior. You see, the believer has his own set of standards. And for God he lived and for God he died. Oh, praise his name. Believers are not to be attached to the unbelievers. Believer. Your, your cut buddy and your idol should not be the unbeliever. Your idol should be Jesus Christ. Your God should be Jesus Christ. What you want to do, you want to please your maker. You want to please the creator. And you want to please God because God is your God. And he is your sustainer. Are y'all going to pray with me a little while? The believer is not to be so united that they got to get involved with what they're involved in. Believers are not to be in covenant with the unbeliever. The believer is not to be following the leadership of the unbeliever. So if you know who's leading the unbeliever, which is Satan, you when you find out what's really going on, you got to get make up in your mind, say, I got to come out of this. I had a friend of mine that was so close to me. He was my ace boom coon. He was my cut buddy. I loved Marvin and Marvin loved me. We would go hunting together and go fishing together. But as we as Marvin got older, he began to start getting involved in stuff I can't get involved in. He started drinking the whiskey and smoking. He started getting involved in a whole lot of stuff. And it hurt my heart so bad. Because my friend Marvin, he was just like a blood brother to me. And when he started going another direction, I had to make up in my mind that I can't hang with him like I used to. It hurt my heart because my friend, my dear, dear friend was moving into another direction. I didn't walk off and leave him, but I told Marvin, I said, I told Marvin, I said, Marvin, you got asthma and you really can't afford to do this. 
And what about your God? What about things that you involved in? And I want y'all to know, he said, I like what I'm doing. But I can't let nobody uh, push me into that category because I am a believer. I'm not trying to condemn nobody because all of us have done something. Lift your hand and say, I have done something. I've done something that I shouldn't have done. And I'm not here to judge you. I'm not here to criticize you. But I'm trying to help somebody. Whatever you do, I love you regardless. And I love you with the love of the Lord. <laughs> but my friend Marvin, <laughs> he drank his liquor and got hooked on it. <laughs> and he wasn't able to shake it off. <laughs> and finally he got some roses of the liver. <laughs> and he died at the age of 35. <laughs> he could have still been living. <laughs> but he couldn't handle that habit. <laughs> and I want y'all to know today <laughs> that sin is highly addictive. Why don't y'all help me here? Can I go up a little bit higher? I want y'all to know that as believers, we must understand that God means what he says. And the believer is not to trust the unclean thing. The believer does not live like the sinner lives. So therefore he is not to participate in the sins that the unbeliever participate in. For God has commanded that the believer live separate from the wicked and the unbeliever. He got to live a separate life. He got to come out from the world. Because the Bible said, love not the world, neither the things that are in. For God said in his word, be ye separate, said the Lord. Help me say, be separate. In other words, you got to draw a line. You got to be separate. And Lord, sometimes that old flesh man, he ain't going to never die. He's always working. He's always stirring up something. But God is telling us there is no need to twist the scripture and no need to ignore his command because God demands separation I said he demands it he has a demand on your separation separation is so important and it's mighty critical it is one of the requirements if you want to be accepted by God, you gonna have to separate. Y'all ain't gonna help me. Separate the Lord. You'll never get the Holy Ghost if you don't separate. You'll never be filled with His Spirit if you don't separate. You'll never have the anointing if you don't separate. You'll never have the power of the Holy Ghost operating in you if you don't separate. Because God says, I'm not coming where you are, but you got to come where I am. Oh, Lord, help me to separate. I say, help me to separate. Oh, praise his name. I want God to receive me. I want him to hear my prayer. And his eyes are open and watching over the righteous. And his ears are open to the righteous prayer. And I'm not saying I do everything right, but my mind is made up. And my focus is on living for the Lord. And if I fall, the Holy Ghost and conviction is down on the inside. I got to get up and I got to shake myself and get my mind right because I want to be accepted by God. So if we separate ourselves and 
begin to pray and consecrate our lives to God, and then God will receive us. And when God receives us, that means he accepts you. It means that he has put his approval on you. He has given the righteousness of Christ and applied it to your life. Are y'all listening to me? Now think about it. You're accepted by God. May not be accepted by you, but I'm accepted by God. And God got you in his hand. And he got me in his hand. But if God accepts me, I don't have to worry about you. And if God accepts me, and you got God in you, we'll walk together. For how can two walk together except they be agreed? You are a believer. And I am a believer, and we got the same man, and he said no division is among you, so we live to please the Lord, and God does not receive a person that lives in sin, he don't receive a person that lives and have a lifestyle of sin, he can't receive a person who lives in worldliness and in immorality and idolatry. But if a person come out, I say if he come out, can I go up a little higher? If he come out from the world and separate, separate, y'all ain't gonna help me. All you cooks that knows about separation you got to separate the egg, the yolk from the white. You crack it, but you don't want to destroy the shell. And so what you do, you start putting it in, trying to separate. You let the yolk fall in one, and then turn around and let it fall in the other side. You turn around and let it fall in the other, and you keep on doing it. Until it separates. Somebody shout separate. Separate. God says separate. And when you separate, God says I receive you. And when we separate and consecrate our lives of God, God says I'll be your father and I'll adopt you. You'll be my sons and daughters. And as his children. We will live in his love. We'll have his affection. We'll have his protection. Can I call up one more time? We'll have his instruction. We'll have his deliverance. We'll have his guidance. We'll have his reproof. And we'll have growth. And we'll begin to chastise us for whom the Lord loves. He chases, but here is the main thing. So as we are believers, he said, cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. And since we are children of God, he expects us to do two things. Clean, help me say clean, clean yourself from all filthiness of your flesh. Clean yourself from all filthiness of your spirit. You see, sin makes man dirty. And there are certain sins that will dirty the body. And there are certain sins that will dirty your spirit. But God is looking for us to perfect holiness. In the fear of God, perfecting is an aggressive word. It demands aggressive action. You've got to make up in your mind that you're going to be aggressive. You cannot practice, oh glory to God, in the lifestyle of the unbeliever. The believer has to practice holiness. He has to practice doing the things 
that will make him holy. The believer has to pursue holiness and pursue aggressively. The believer Help me say the believer will never be as holy as God is because there is no such thing as sinless perfection. But the believer has to set his mind on being holy. I wish I had somebody to say holy. I can't do it by myself. So the motive of this holy living is the fear of God the motive for this holy living is the great reverence and the great respect of God Almighty is inside the believer and when a man sees and when he understands God and he, when he sees that what God has done for him he ceases to fear man and he fear God so here's the conclusion of the whole matter of the whole matter fear God I said fear God and keep his commandments help me say fear God and keep his commandments fear God and keep his commandments which is the whole duty oh man I'm telling God to give me strength if you find anything that's not in me that's not right in me oh oh Lord oh Lord Lord help me say Lord create in me a clean heart and renew in me the right spirit cause I let me say I, 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 I want to be right, I want to be saved, I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Say yes, clap your hands and say yes, say yes.